Hello and welcome to AC 1.2 where we'll be looking at explaining the social construction of crime. Now in our previous AC we looked at the difference between crime and deviance and this is now taking it a step further and asking the question is crime a social construct and what evidence do we have for this? So social construction is referring to something that's been made up or constructed by society rather than just occurring naturally. So therefore what we're saying here from a criminological point of view is that criminality is simply whatever society defines as criminal. So this means that one society or culture can define a particular act as criminal and pass a law against it while another one sees nothing wrong with it and we'll be looking at some instances of this as we go through this powerpoint and likewise as societies change over time um, ideas about crime will, are also going to change and we'll look at that as well so for the purposes of this course and certainly for the exam you've got to have some specific examples of how laws have changed over time how laws vary from culture to culture um, these examples will illustrate this idea that criminality is a social construction. So before we move on, let's pause and think for a bit. So can you think of any activities that are illegal in the UK, but legal in other countries? So if you're watching on YouTube, just pause, jot down some ideas or think of some ideas in your head. And then when you're ready to go, press play and I'll come through with the answer. So pause now. OK, these are some of the ideas that I came up with. Uh, it's not an inexhaustible list. There are plenty more, but um, activities that are legal in the UK, but are legal in other countries. Polygamy, honour crimes, selling cannabis, assisted suicide, vagrancy, corporal punishment, female genital mutilation. So likewise, same thing again. Can you think of any activities that are legal in the UK? but illegal in other countries. Again, pause when I say, and then unpause when you're ready for some answers. So pause now. And some of the things that I came up with were adultery, homosexuality, jaywalking, prostitution, and abortion. And my third category, can you think of any activities that used to be illegal, but are now legal in the UK? Again, pause now. And I came up with two examples, homosexuality and abortion. And finally, can you think of any activities that used to be legal in the UK and are now illegal? Again, pause. And I came up with slavery, corporal punishment and driving without a seatbelt. And there are many others. Ironically, the driving without a seatbelt, I remember in my youth, we were all encouraged to wear a seatbelt. It wasn't compulsory, but we were encouraged to do it. So to make us feel safe, we were told to clunk, click every trip. But the man that did the adverts was Jimmy Savile. So I'm not sure how safe we really were, but there we go. So uh, moving on. So let's look at this first idea. And quite often we do get questions on this in the exam, how laws change from culture to culture. And I'm going to give you some specific examples here that you can use to illustrate this idea. And the first one I'm going to use is polygamy. So polygamy is the practice of having more than one wife or husband at the same time. Um, polygyny, which is where a man may take two or uh, where a man may take two or more wives is legal in 58 countries, whereas polyandry, where a woman can take two or more husbands, is confined to just a handful of societies, mainly the Himalayas. So you know, men can have more than one wife, women can't tend to not be able to have more than one husband. So polygamy is the term we use for more than one husband or wife. So where is it legal? <coughs> well, excuse me, uh, polygamy is mainly legal in Muslim or African countries, uh, in five multicultural societies which have a large Muslim population, so India, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore and Sri Lanka, the law allows polygamy but only for Muslims. But it's a crime in most countries. So some Muslim countries such as Turkey and Tunisia 
view it as a crime. In the UK, anyone who goes through a marriage ceremony where they're still married to someone else commits the crime of bigamy. And that's punishable with up to seven years imprisonment, a fine or both. So there's your example of polygamy. So <coughs> you might then dig a bit deeper and go, OK, so we've got polygamy that's allowed in some cultures, but not in others. Why is that the case? What's the reason behind it? And the main reason here is religion. So in the Muslim holy book, the Quran, Muslim men are permitted to take up to four wives. And this is then reflected in the laws of Muslim majority countries. In the USA, the Mormon church practiced polygamy until 1890. And it still continues to be practiced illegally by some fundamentalist Mormon splinter groups. And so that's the link with religion, but there's also tradition. Polygamy is traditionally practiced in some African societies, although it would be true to say it has declined sharply in recent decades. So it's religion and it's tradition. The main one really probably being religion. So our second example we're going to take for laws changing from culture to culture is the laws about adultery. So we've looked at polygamy, now let's look at adultery. Again, another example you can use. So adultery involves a sexual act between two people, one or both of whom are married to someone else. It's legal in most countries, so you can commit adultery. It's uh, not punishable at all. Uh, adultery is not against the law in the UK. It ceased to be a crime in India in 2018. But it is a crime in quite a few societies. Most societies that criminalise adultery, again, are Muslim majority countries, but several Christian majority countries in Africa also make it a criminal offence, as do the Philippines, Taiwan, and 21 of the 50 US states. And punishments across the globe vary from stoning to death, which is quite rare, to caning, such as this example here in Malaysia and Indonesia, to if you're caught in USA in the state of Rhode Island, it's a fine. And again, why does that vary between cultures? And again, it's down to religion. Most religions condemn adultery. It's one of the Ten Commandments, which is shared by Christianity, Islam and Judaism. Thou shalt not commit adultery, do not commit adultery. So in societies where lawmaking is being strongly influenced by religion, Adultery is often a crime, and that's the reason behind it. But also, some might argue that it, this law also reflects society's treatment of women. The idea that laws against adultery are often found in societies where women occupy a more subordinate position. Usually in those societies, the adultery laws are themselves unequal. If the woman commits adultery, it's bad. It's not such an issue for the man. And I find this quote quite interesting. You know, the um, the idea from Bill, Bill Mayer, who is a quite a, a renowned atheist, he views the do not commit adultery as more reflecting the view that women were viewed as property in those times. You know, women are also property in our Bible. Adultery is a property crime in the Old Testament, not a sex crime. So there's something to consider there. Moving on we we'll look at our third example, which is that of homosexuality. Now, I'm going to do this in more detail because I'm going to make a big case study of this. But just to give you some ideas, homosexuality, obviously sexual acts between members of the same sex. Um, it's treated as a crime in a number of countries. Where is it legal? Well, it's legal in the UK, Europe, North and South America, although it's a crime in many Muslim countries. And in Indonesia, the world's largest Muslim state by population, it is legal, though. Uh, and it's a crime, uh, it's illegal in 70 countries and in 45 for lesbian relationships. In six countries, there is the death penalty for it. And in some countries such as Russia, it's not illegal, but the law bans its promotions. So uh, many countries, uh, although they don't criminalize homosexuality, do not allow same sex couples to marry or adopt. So if that's illegal, there are still, um, if you are gay, you're prevented from doing things that other people in society who aren't gay are able to do. So why is this the case? Well, 
Again, it goes back to religion. Many religions, including Christianity, Islam and Judaism, have traditionally condemned it. Countries where religion has a strong influence over lawmaking are more likely to have laws against homosexuality. So in secular societies, in the non-religious ones, social norms are generally more tolerant of sexual diversity. And this is um, the commandment from the book of Leviticus in the Bible. So again, the holy book of Judaism and Christianity and also Islam view this um, as, as important as well. You shall not lie with a man as with a woman. It's an abomination. And then later on, this is the punishment. If a man has sexual relations with a man, both of them have done what's detestable. They are to be put to death. Um, public opinion um, also has a factor on whether the societies uh, allow homosexuality or not. Recent polls show higher levels of support for bans on homosexuality in some countries. And um, some of these countries are where religion has a strong influence. So, for instance, in 95 percent of Egypt believe homosexuality should be rejected. But others, such as Russia, um, are not so tolerant, uh, you know, re uh, more intolerant. So um, it's also linked to sexism. The fact that male homosexuality is a crime in more countries than lesbianism is perhaps due to sexist assumptions by male lawmakers that women are incapable of same sex attraction. So we've looked at how laws apply differently from culture to culture. We've looked at some examples, polygamy, um, homosexuality, adultery. But also you need to consider how laws are applied differently according to circumstances. So one of the things to consider here is that, you know, through, over the, throughout the world, most people would argue that everyone is subject to the law and that it should be applied equally to all within the culture. There are therefore few instances of when laws are applied differently. But one example you can use is concerning the age of criminal responsibility. So that's when you become criminally responsible for your actions and can be prosecuted in a court. Now the age of criminal responsibility in the UK is 10. So that means any child under 10 years of age can't be arrested, charged or prosecuted for a criminal offence, no matter how much blame you can attribute to them. Now, we're 10, but in other countries it's completely different. And I've got my little map here that you can look at to your heart's content to see the difference. So it, it, it ranges widely across the world. In America, it's zero. But in Canada, it's 12, so two years older than we are in the UK. In Bangladesh, the age is nine. In China, it's under 16 in general. So as you can see, laws are applied differently due to age because the age of criminal responsibility around the world differs. So in America, you can be charged from one second after birth. Uh, in America, in UK, you've got to be 10, in Canada, 12, in China, 16. Look at the map at your leisure. And you can also um, talk about specific instances where laws are applied differently. So there are occasions when, despite, despite murder taking place with the, you've got the actus reus, you've got your guilty act, you've got your mens rea, you've got your guilty mind, but the law does allow an alternative charge of manslaughter to be made. And this charge of manslaughter only happens in specific circumstances including perhaps where the defender is, offender is said to have suffered from diminished responsibility or is acting under a, a loss of self-control. And these circumstances act as a partial defence. So that means that rather than face a mandatory life sentence for murder, the law allows the charge of manslaughter where instead of just you have to give a life sentence, the judge has all sentencing options open for them, community, incarceration, fine, whatever. And these partial defences are only available to the charge of murder. But there are other examples, there are other defences that show the person's not guilty of defence. And those are consent, where permission was provided by the appropriate, appropriate person for the crime to occur, so someone allows you to do the crime. Self-defence and great new word, automatism, when the defender's not in control of their actions. And that sometimes a successful means a person has a not guilty 
um, plea for a uh, not guilty uh, plea upheld by the law. Self-defense, automatism and consent. So this leads us on to our in-depth case study of how laws change over time. And I've chosen to look at the UK laws concerning homosexuality. So we're going to look at a case study in depth on homosexuality. Now, what I've done is there are lots of dates here. And the idea here is you get a feel for how the law has changed over time and why it's changed in this country. But the key dates I've highlighted in yellow, because I think these are the ones that if I was doing a, um, a, a, a big question on this, these are the dates or these are the acts that I'd get in. So just as laws can change from one culture to another, so laws change over time within society. And as I said, for the exam, you've got to have one in-depth example of how legislation has changed over time. You can use the other examples of polygamy, adultery, etc. Um, but this is the one that you can use to get, give specific examples. Um, so we go back to 1533, where the Buggery Act made anal sex an offence punishable by hanging. So prior to 1533, um, homosexuality, if you, if you did the deed, you were dealt with by church courts. But 1533 made homosexuality, the actual act of anal sex, a, uh, an offence punishable by death. It was repealed 20 years later, but then it was 10 years later was reenacted. So from 1533, homosexuality was punishable by death. And there you see... Um, a newspaper article of two people, James Pratt and John Smith, um, who were um, hanged for homosexuality there. They were the last people in this country to get the death penalty, and that occurred in 1835. They were the last people to be hanged for sodomy, which is uh, the act of anal sex. Uh, then the next probably most important event is 1861 the offences against the persons act and that removed the death penalty for homosexuality so male homosexual acts remained illegal but instead of being punishable by death they were punishable by imprisonment so the death penalty for homosexuality is removed but nevertheless it still remains a crime and imprisonment is the standard punishment we then move to 1885, where the law is actually amended to include any kind of sexual activity. If you remember, prior to that, it was just anal sex buggery um, um, under the Buggery Act. But now it's even kissing, holding hands and whatever. Um, and then the famous Victorian playwright, Oscar Wilde, there he is, was convicted under this law um, for kissing another man and was sentenced to two years of hard labour. Uh, the irony is that, of course, lesbianism was seen as being perfectly acceptable or not illegal. Um, so that's where we go till the 1950s. Uh, and, the, and the homosexuality laws were actively enforced. Uh, so by the end of 1954, there were 1,069 gay men in prison in England and Wales. They had an average age of 37. There were a number of high profile arrests and trials, including that of the scientist and mathematician, you may not have heard about him, uh, the wartime code breaker, Alan Turing. So Alan Turing was the man who uh, broke the Enigma code, probably um, won us, um, his, his findings partially helped to win us in World War II. But what reward did he get for that? He was convicted in 1952 of gross indecency. And rather than go to um, prison, he accepted treatment with female hormones, so a chemical castration as an alternative. And he ended up committing suicide in 1954 as a result of that. So there you go. That's Alan Turing. We then move through to 1954. The trial and eventual imprisonment of Edward Montague, third Baron of Bewley, Michael Pitt Rivers and Peter Wildblood for committing acts of homosexual indecency caused uproar, led to the establishment of committee to examine and report on the law covering homosexual offences. So they started, society starting to change its opinion, thinking, hang on, this is just getting ridiculous. We need to look into this. So in 1957, the Wolfenden report was published 
and it recommended that homosexual behaviour between consenting adults in private should no longer be a criminal offence. And that was recommended in 1957 and not until 10 years later, 1967, did the Sexual Offences Act become law. Now, to give you some sort of idea, I know it's hard to believe when you look at my youthful good looks, but I was born in 1964. So in my lifetime, homosexuality was illegal. And what the Sexual Offences Act of 1967 did was it, um, it still said, you know, buggery and indecency to be men, between men is still illegal, but we're going to decriminalise homosexual acts, providing that three conditions are fulfilled. So A, if the act's consensual, it's OK. It's got to take place in private and you've got to be over the age of 21. If you do that, that's fine. Uh, by private, they meant in your own house. So if you did it in a hotel or something like that, that wasn't acceptable. But the age of consent was 21. So 67 was when it started to shift away from being illegal. We then move all the way through to 1994. By 1994, I've been teaching seven years. And in 1994, the age of consent for homosexual men was reduced to 18. Um, an amendment to equalise the age of consent for same sex to 16 was actually defeated in the uh, House of Commons uh, by 307 votes to 280. So they tried to bring it down to 16, but various MPs voted against that. So whilst it was perfectly acceptable to have heterosexual sex at 16, still in 1994, so I'd been to university, I'd started teaching, still the age of consent was 18 for homosexuality. We then moved to 1997 when the European Court of Human Rights said, actually, Britain, UK, you're breaking the law. It's not acceptable for you to have a higher minimum age for male homosexual acts than everywhere else. So you need to change that. And so in 2001, and this is another key uh, milestone there, the Sexual Offences Amendment Act came into force throughout the UK on the 8th of January. And that lowered the age of consent to 16. And also this act introduced for the first time an age of consent for lesbian sexual acts, because previously there'd been no legislation against it. So it wasn't until 2001, this century, that the age of consent for homosexuality was given parity with heterosexual sex. So this century. We then move on to 2002, where the law changed to allow same-sex couples to adopt. Before that, they weren't allowed to. And then the big change in 2004, the Sexual Offences Act came into form, and basically that got rid of all previous legislation, including that 1967 Act, introduced completely neutral offences, previous conditions related to privacy were removed, and basically what it said is sexual acts were viewed by law without regard to the sex of the, the gender of the participants. Doesn't matter whether you're male, female, female you know, whatever. Uh, the sexual act is 16 and over. It doesn't matter who, what gender you are if you're partaking in it. Everyone's equal. So that was 2004. In 2005, the Civil Partnership Act came into effect. And that's when the first civil partnership ceremony took place. And that was at 11 o'clock uh, on the 5th of December 2005 between these uh, two gentlemen here. Uh, it's quite a, a sad story, this. They, um, they've been living together for ages. They had a civil partnership. Guy here was terminally ill. Uh, the, the civil partnership took place in a hospice and I think he died the very next day. But at least, you know, he survived long enough to have the civil partnership with the man he loved. 2013, the Marriage Same-Sex Couples Act allow, um, allowed same-sex marriage in England and Wales. That was passed by Parliament, came into force in March 2014. And the first same-sex marriages took place on the 29th of March 2014. So the civil partnership is more about legally getting, a, um, you know, having the right to property next, you know, next to kin, that sort of stuff. Marriage is slightly different. And then we get to 2017, the Policing and Crime Act actually posthumously pardoned the thousands of homosexual men from England and Wales who'd been convicted under the, those regions' old sodomy laws. So if you think about it, 
in my lifetime, um, 20, you, you, someone could have been found guilty in 1966 or 65 of homosexuality. They would still have that criminal record. Let's say they they were 22 in 1965. Still in in, in 2017, you'd be um, you'd be in your 70s, your 80s, but you still have that criminal record. So in 2017, all those criminal records were wiped. Good thing too. And so there's the headline. You know, new law gives gay men posthumous pardons. So. It was known as Turing's Law, and in 2017, the Merchant Shipping Homosexual Conduct Act, dis which had disallowed homosexual ground, uh, acts to be grounds for dismissal for the crew of merchant ships. So that was an old law that they just got shot off in 2017. And then finally, the last little thing that came through in 2019, the Department of Education actually made it law that all schools had to teach RSE, Relationships, Sex, Education, and health education and the guidelines issued to school require acknowledgement of LGBT rights, including legalization of same sex marriage, protection of the physical and mental well being of LGBT children. So, a big change. So, in my lifetime, there's been a massive change in attitudes to homosexuality. The law has changed. So, part of me wondered, you know, why was this the case? You know, why? Did these laws have these laws changed so dramatically in the last 40 or 50 years? And I think it's partly due to the fact that homosexuality is no longer seen by a lot of people as deviant. So attitudes that deviant, what was viewed as deviance has changed and it's because people become more accepting. And I think that's mainly due to the fact that high, many high profile celebrities have come out and that they're openly gay. And I think that's commit, contributed to this change in attitude. I can certainly remember in 19, in the early 80, 1980s, watching Top of the Pops when this man came on, Boy George in Culture Club, and, you know, not, not being absolutely gobsmacked by the look of, um, of Boy George. And he was openly gay, he openly talked about his homosexuality. Uh, the, um, this gave rise to the new romantic scene. There were lots of people who were known as gender benders. And he was open and attitude started to change. Likewise, Elton John came out as being gay and, that, and that's opened all sorts of things up. Uh, this guy here, ex-Wales rugby union captain, first rugby player to openly come out as gay. Other TV pro presenters, uh, Sue Perkins. Uh, this was the first um, MP to be openly gay in the cabinet. Nigel Owens, the... Um, the rugby referee and other TV personalities, etc., etc. So high profile, as well as you know, high profile people being openly gay, you've got campaigns as well, pressure groups. So Gay Pride, Stonewall have all raised awareness of these issues, and that I think has made the difference. So that's uh, the final little bit. Um, these changes to legislation I think demonstrate how changing societal attitudes, deviance often lead to changes in the law. And this is really strong evidence for the social construction of criminality. Something that was criminal in 1966 is now longer, is no, now viewed as acceptable by our country, not in other countries, but in our country, because attitudes have changed. I hope you found that useful. Get those key dates down, have your case study ready, and I'll see you soon for my next video. Take care.